Welcome everyone who is listening or watching today. We do because we care and deeply love church. My name is Marek Kucharski and I work at Evangelical School of Theology in Wrocław, Poland. And in light of so many recent challenges, we continue, continue interviews titled Church New Challenges. Today, I invited Dr. Mark Young, president of Denver Seminary. Dzień dobry, Marku. Uh, how about, um, let me first say a few words about you before we start, okay? Okay. Uh, Dr. Mark Young is a theological educator and pastoral leader for nearly 40 years of global ministry experience. Uh, before joining De Denver Seminary in 2009, he served as a professor of World Missions and Intercultural Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. By the way, I, I, I've met uh, a few students uh, being in your class uh, and, and they were speaking highly about you. Well, thanks. And, and, and Marek uh, uh, was the founding academic dean of the Biblical Theological Seminary in Wrocław, Poland. Uh, and I actually was the first student of BTS in Wrocław, so it was 30 years ago. Um, and additionally, EST in Wrocław is a continuation of BTS uh, today. Okay, Marco, before we start, what is your first memory of Poland? Oh, I first came to Poland in 1979, believe it or not. And I was a part of a youth camp uh, sponsored by the Owaza movement in uh, the mountains near Zakopane. Uh -huh. So my first memories of Poland are a very beautiful place. A, a place of uh, beautiful villages and and wonderful relationships. Um, by the way, let me say thank you for speaking English today. It's been far too long since I spoke Polish regularly, and I'm sure I wouldn't be able to express myself well. So thank you for coming my direction and speaking English. Uh, yeah, well, I hope my pronunciation will be enough uh, to, to, to be able to understand. Uh, okay, Marek, uh, while we were making arrangements for the interview, you say, sent me a great article from Christianity Today with title, Justice Too Long Delayed by Timothy Dalrymple. Um, first of all, I, I'm, I was shocked. I mean, great article. I think I hadn't uh, uh, read anything better about races that, that in a concise way. Um, I got a new perspectives. I learned a lot. Mm, secondly, I'm not going to pretend I was really inspired to write many of the questions uh, by the text. So, uh, reading the article, um, we find such a statement, okay? We cannot love our brothers and sisters well if we cannot tell their story in truth. So, what is their story in truth? Yeah, that's a good question. So, as in every country, as a child goes through the educational system, they learn a narrative about the founding of their country and the virtues of their country. And certainly part of the purpose of that narrative is to create a sense of loyalty, sense of patriotism. It happens in every country where there is a, some type of a, of a universal educational approach. And I think in the United States, it would be fair to say that the story of American history has been dominated and written largely by white people who acknowledged that there was a long period of time where an institution called slavery existed that didn't necessarily talk about the incredible inconsistencies between the declarative documents of the founding of our country and the way black people were denied the basic rights and the basic privileges that the rest of the population was given. And then after that, of course, the Civil War concludes in the United States in the late 1800s. Then you have the Emancipation Proclamation, which legally sets slaves free, enslaved Africans uh, free. But let's be honest, segregation, oppression, uh, taking advantage of enslaved, now free Afri people of African origin continues in the United States for economic benefit, as well as, uh, frankly, for social harm. Mm -hmm. So that story isn't told well in the way we learn our own history. 
And I think, to be honest, uh, certainly my generation, I was born in 1956. So I grew up in the middle of what was called the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. which was about a, oh, a, a, a hundred year or let's say a 90 year wait from the end of the Emancipation Proclamation where the African-American community said enough is enough. Um, I, I knew that was happening, but certainly didn't involve myself in it or really understand the conditions that led to it. So I cannot tell the story of the black population in the United States well if I'm not willing to face the truth of the history of our nation. And we're not willing to teach that truth in the way we educate our next generation. So, so there are stories, actually, story of suffer, uh, suffering, uh, mistreatment. Uh, I mean, do you think in uh, 1968, uh, after Luther King's uh, death and protests, did that finish? I mean, segregation was kind of acknowledged and gone. Yeah, I think we need to be careful and think about the difference between that which is legal and mm -hmm. that which is uh, cultural oh. or that which is based on uh, premise. So let's just back up all the way to the beginning of the slave trade. The foundational principle, the foundational belief is that white people, and let's be clear, these are um, white people of European origin, Mm -hmm. believe that black people are not fully human and can therefore be bought and sold like cattle or any other commodity mm -hmm. that then is transported and finds its um, field of growth in the United States, which was developing as an agrarian culture. So the foundation of all segregation and racism is the premise, not all of it, but in our situation is white supremacy. Mm -hmm. That somehow white people are better and that white people ought to be separate from, ought to separate themselves from people of African origin. So even though you have the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation that sets slaves free, even though you have the Civil Rights Act of the 1960s, which gave African Americans more rights related to voting, related to excuse me, uh, property and other, other ways that they had been limited since the end of the Emancipation Proclamation, none of that really addressed the problem. That's a deeply embedded attitude and belief. Yeah, actually, when I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a witness as a visitor in USA, and I was in Raleigh, and I visited one of the museums of civil wars, and I was shocked that this was not solved by that war. And, and actually, I... I Whenever I ask a white ha USA person about slavery or racism, I usually heard the answer that this is a very complex situation, you know, or I mainly heard a big silence, you know, kind of uncomfortable situation. On the, on the other side, you know, for instance, uh, when my wife Agnieszka and me visited Memphis a year ago, where, you know, there's a big population of, of uh, black Amer African Americans, and it was a Saturday soccer game. Uh, was going on. So we saw a big crowd, a mixture of ethnicity and happy people uh, joining time together. We saw police, police officers, you know, with white and black skin. And we were witnesses of unity, different ethnicities together and no races at all. So where has the tension been hidden for at least 60 years? Well, the tension's been hidden for centuries. <laughs> and I think that, I, I, let's back up and say, when we talk about racism, uh, white people like to think of racism as individual acts of aggression or individual acts of destruction against those of another race, right? Mm -hmm. So particularly my generation, Marek, we grew up, or I grew up seeing images of people attacking black people and who are marching peacefully. And so racism for me was the, were these people doing individual acts of violence against black people. What I wasn't aware of or understand is that there continue to be systems in our educational or 
practices in our educational systems, in our banking systems, that fundamentally made it more difficult, if not impossible, for Black families, African American families, to generate the kind of foundation economically and educationally to advance in society. Mm -hmm. So those were hidden to most of us. We weren't necessarily a part of it. And so we didn't want to admit that there was a systemic um, bias that prohibited African Americans from progressing. And the two basic channels are education and economics, right? Mm -hmm. So at some point along the way, we are able to anesthetize ourselves and our feelings to self justify ourselves that we're not the ones beating black people or turning dogs loose on them or spraying them with water cannons. We're not those people. So therefore we're not racist. So when you go to a soccer game on a Saturday, yeah, you can find certainly people of various races together. They're brought together by a common activity. They're brought together because their children are participating on a common team. And they could have relationships across those racial lines and they could truly attempt to understand and work for racial justice. But I think it would be face, safe to say that the majority of white Americans don't have that. They're cordial, they're kind, they will participate with people from other races in those particular events. But if you were to ask them, does systemic racism, does systemic prejudice, does white supremacy, still play a part in American society, they'd probably say no. Okay, okay. Um, well, it seems that we were wrong, you know, just, just viewing that, uh, witnessing that picture. Um, uh, let me talk, I, I've read in this article about this fiction, you know, I mean, you mentioned some of that, that black people are not as good as white people, are not the equals of white people and are less evolved, less human, less capable, less worthy, less deserving than white people. Shocking for me is the, the, the statement, white churches were not only complicit in writing this fiction, they gave it to the imprimatur of God. I'm, I mean, can you comment on that? Yes, of course. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's clear that when we come out of the 17th century, well, let's back up. Let's say that even at the founding of our nation, where most of those who are a part of those early years come from Christian Europe, meaning that their heritage philosophically and religiously, religiously is Christian. And so a man like Thomas Jefferson can write, all men are created equal in our Declaration of Independence, but he's a slave owner, mm -hmm. right? So he has already chosen to say that a person, because of the color of their skin, can be owned, can be owned. Now think about that, can be my possession that I then can do with whatever I want. So there was a large disconnect between this idea that somehow God was a part of the founding of our nation, and yet we were treating a part of the, those who were resident on, our, on this continent as if they weren't fully human. When we get to the Civil War era, you find people reading the same Bible and coming to different conclusions. There were Christians, white Christians, in both the North and the South, who felt that white supremacy and slavery were moral evils and needed to be abolished. But there were white Christians who argued that, number one, the Bible actually allowed for slavery because we see passages in the Old and New Testament that refer to slavery. And number two, that God had providentially created and blessed this nation and that slave labor was something that God had used to bless the nation and was ordained. Mm. And then there's, there are these obscure passages that God had ordained the separation of races and in even a more hideous way, there were those who believed that black people were um, those who came from the cursed line of Ham, who was one of the three sons of Noah. So there were these theological arguments that were given Mm -hmm. uh, more than anything else, it was an attempt to, to justify what white people wanted to be true by appealing to Bible verses and to theological points. Mm -hmm. 
But I, I think, Marek, I think it's important for us to say something as well about white supremacy as not just an American problem, mm -hmm. but as a European problem as well, with its mm -hmm. roots in European history. And, and I say this not as an indictment. I just want, to, want us to be sure that we recognize that the idea of black people being less than human, the idea of black people being a commodity, less capable, less intelligent, less worthy of dignity, uh, was, was prosecuted by European slave traders from the beginning. And, and you know, I, I think uh, I'm always a little bit uh, hesitant to talk about with my European friends the fact that white supremacy is still alive in uh, European settings as well. Yeah. I remember when we first moved to Wrocław, mm -hmm. there was a part of the city where a particular population lived behind walls. Um, the, the, the Roma population, the, the mm -hmm. sometimes called the gypsy. I, I think yeah. the word was uh, Cigania. Cigania, yeah. Cigania. Um, and there were some pretty strong attitudes about those people, weren't there? Yeah, oh yeah. So let's let's say I'm not saying that to justify the U.S. at all. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I'm saying it's a universal challenge that is deeply, deeply rooted in um, in whiteness. Yeah. In whiteness. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, I mean, finding that evangelical commu communities were silent in the face of slavery. I mean, that's one of the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I, I read something in June 1995. There was a, this Southern Baptist Convention, which came into being during a north-south split over slavery. So, so actually, uh, they acknowledge historic acts of evil, and then they apologized. Uh, to all African Americans, you know, perpetu uh, for perpetuating in individual and systematic race and racism in their lifetime. Yes. I mean, do you find any other examples of such acts, or this was just a one-time thing? You know, denominationally, there have been several groups who have made statements denouncing racism and admitting their participation in it. Uh, that's not been a that's not a novel thing. It was obviously significant that the Southern Baptists made this statement because in the United States, clearly the South was most associated with uh, slavery um, and white supremacy, and it was most endorsed by the church there. So it was a significant statement for them to make, um, and certainly those who made it, excuse me, were sincere. In their, in their intent. Did that then translate into changed attitudes throughout the denomination, which is several million in size, and into the preaching and into the educational structures for the next generation of children? I think that's a question that, that is probably um, yet to be answered. Denominations in the United States, as you know, have very little control, particularly in the Baptist world, uh, over uh, individual individual congregations. So was it sincere? Yes. Was it important? Yes. Did it change attitudes in the millions of people who go to Southern Baptist churches? Perhaps somewhat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, give us an update how things are right now. I mean, we don't get too much information here. I mean, just, you know, barely fit some, some pictures. And as I understand, protests are still going on for, you know, over more than two weeks, I think. Yes, uh, there are some protests still going on. I have to confess that I'm not aware of uh, significant violence continuing to occur through those protests. I think it's important to say that the reaction to the protests mm -hmm. um, pretty much divided along political lines. Mm -hmm. So um, were you to look at the more conservative Republican view, they would focus on the violence and the, the lawlessness. If you look at the more progressive view, they would focus on the reason why people were protesting, the uh, inciting events, the, the death of George Floyd, uh, the murder. Yeah. of George Floyd, of uh, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. And well, let's be honest, just five years ago, a white man walked into a black church and murdered nine women at a yeah. Bible school. So 
this is not something that just happened after a long, long period of time. It happens on an iterative basis. I think it's unfortunate, to be honest, that um, the white the white population, let me back to say it another way, that some part of the white population is unwilling to admit that the causes of these protests are real and legitimate and must be addressed. I would say that I see more um, of a broad-based recognition of the problem of systemic racism, the uh, George Floyd, the video of George, George Floyd's murder, where a police officer literally chokes the life out of a black man who's saying he can't breathe, is so shocking that I think there has been more of a groundswell of support saying we must do something, we must admit what's happening, and we must take action. Whether that translates into changes in the political structure, I don't, I don't know, nor would I dare to predict. I hope so. Uh, I don't think we're in a good place as a nation politically at this point. We lack leadership with any sense of moral compass. Mm. And so as a result, um, in, all, in all honesty, I think the country is, uh, there are, there's more division now than any time in my, in my lifetime. Yeah, talking about your country, I've, I found a very interesting picture um, I'll, I'll share with you. You know, the, the dog represents black and white, and then the couch is your country right now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, your system, system uh, <laughs> when I saw it, I thought, wow, this is a perfect <laughs> picture yeah. of, of, of how you can view it. Uh, the dog probably, you know, doesn't even recognize he's black and white. <laughs> that's right. Well, I think that's very, very poignant. Well, I, I think it's important to say that um, a recognition of injustice is not enough. It really has to then be translated into policy, and then policy has to be then translated into practice. Mm -hmm. um, and am I hopeful that we may see some changes in policy? Um, yes, if there are the um, uh, if there's a change at the leadership, political leadership levels, locally and nationally, will there be a change in practice? I do think there will be in some parts. And um, and I also want to be clear to say that the from a generational perspective, my children and my children. Are growing up in environments that are much more racially diverse and are much more comfortable in those environments and building those relationships in, in those racially diverse environments that are going to be critical for us moving forward. So I'm hopeful that there will be both uh, political change and generational change of attitudes and practices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have, I mean, we don't have a similar situation, but after the Second War, you know, we had to deal with you know about what do we do about russians and germans and yes. after you know more than 60 years still those discussions are going on okay yeah. you're a great thinker and i i mean i i, I really appreciate uh, uh you your thoughts and insight as a theologian uh what is the sin of racism how would you you know oh, it, starts, it starts with the dehumanization of another and the supremacy of the supremacy of, of white people. Uh, I, let me be quick to say, certainly there are other uh, practices of racism and attitudes of racism that uh, are not where white people aren't involved. But we're, let's focus on that. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea that a human being is less than human mm -hmm. and less than fully dignified that is the that is a horrific sin. It is at the at the root of racism and certainly is one that must be, uh, must be confessed. Um, I think secondly, there is, a, there is a theological problem about the nature of the gospel and what it means to come to faith in Jesus Christ. What did Christ accomplish? American evangelicalism is very individualistic, right? So the gospel for us is a personal spiritual transaction. Yeah. So we, you know, we call that the gospel of personal benefit, the gospel of the cross. Jesus died for you. Believe 
you're born again, repent of your sins, you're born again, and that's enough. But the gospel also has clear social implications. The gospel of the kingdom says that the people of God live according to a different value set. So I think we, as an, as an evangel white evangelical movement, we have to re re understand or relearn the scope of the implications of the gospel for us, both personally and socially. I think that's a very, very significant uh, change for us. You know, it's interesting. I'll say one uh, one more thing here. Yeah. Our American evangelicalism is essentially a revivalist religion. Mm -hmm. Our roots are in the Great Awakenings, the revival movements that yeah. swept across the land and then later carried on by D.L. Moody and Billy Graham. And um, as a little boy, I would go to revival <laughs> In the church and uh, you know the same group of people twice a year would come to the revival meetings and they'd get saved all over again and rededicate their you know it was all kind of program but here's what was interesting to me in those revival meetings we were always called to repent to repent of our sins mm -hmm. and those sins were all pretty much always the same they had to do with sex they had to do with alcohol they had to do with with greed and lying personal moral failures mm -hmm. never once do i recall in a revival meeting being called to repent for the sin of white supremacy or for racism it was always the personal stuff it was always the behave personal behaviors not this these attitudes and then this whole system of injustice that we were participating in yeah 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 Okay, I'm sure you have, uh, you know, friends who are African Americans. Uh, what would be your honest and heartfelt feedback to all uh, these friends in the context of re recent protests? Just yeah, certainly. I think it's always important for us to admit that we recognize how, as a white as a white person, we benefited from an unfair system in both economics and in education and other jurisprudence it would be another area for sure and to and to and to say we we're sorry for that we confess that that is the case uh, and then secondarily to listen I, I don't i don't want to say anything right now i want to listen first i want to hear what it is um, that our black brothers and sisters are saying and and i want them to know that i hear I want them to, to recognize that I am listening. Um, I do think that white people need to talk about race to white people. Mm -hmm. I've never been in a meaningful conversation about race or racism that was originated by a white person. Mm -hmm. We put the burden on black Americans to carry the conversation about race when we as white Americans have perpetuated the systems that create systemic racism. So I think at some point, um, not at some point, I think now white people need to talk to one another about white privilege, white supremacy and racism. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because it's very difficult for a white person uh, to understand how they feel. Uh, like, like I, I, you know, I heard uh, somebody ask a white person how black people feel in America, and they he couldn't say. But he he gave an example. He said he has a friend who is black, and then just in one year he was pulled over with a car driving seven times, and then this white person said, "I have I haven't been pulled over over my whole life driving seven times." Right. So, and that. Uh, that creates this uh, difference, you know, and, and, and I'm thinking, wow, uh, uh, the people can feel uh, because of this color scheme that they are mistreated somehow or, you know, sure. Sure. So, so this listening is, 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 is interesting. Yes. I'm thinking about making a change, you know, I mean, I, I was shocked uh, in with one of the information uh, when you take a period periods of time on uh, 1955 and 70 and th that that's where you were born i was yeah. born in 1970 by the way so you find that there were 62 percent of black children born 
uh, in this period and were raised in poor neighborhoods. Right. And, and compared to 4% of white children. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's first shocking information. But then there is a, uh, another one, because when you take another period of time, 85 to 2000, the problem just deepened because you find 66% of black children raised in poor and 6% you know, of white children. So, I mean, how do, we, how do you make the difference? How do you start? How would you encourage at least evangelical churches to start just practically? What do we do? Sure, good question. Well, we've talked about the recognition issue, right? Admitting that there's a significant problem both attitudinally and systemically. We can make changes in both those arenas. We can change the way we think about ourselves and we think about others in the arenas of the systems of injustice that are in place. We can also help by providing the resourcing that we have available to us to help those who have no resourcing available. I'll give you an example. Um, when someone, as we said earlier, there are two ways, generally speaking, mm-hmm. in our economy that you can build generational wealth. So generational wealth means that the people, your children, had more resources than you had, and you continue then to be able to thrive. Two ways. One was through education, and one was through um, home ownership, property ownership. Mm-hmm. Now, in both cases, up through the 1960s, and certainly we could say even beyond, there were systems that segregated black children from access to quality education. Mm -hmm. and prohibited them from being able to even uh, own property in neighborhoods where those property values would rise. Uh, There was a practice called redlining, where banks would not loan money to black people for certain neighborhoods. So one thing the church can do is, in understanding those problems, ask how can a resource-rich body help help utilize their resources to help um, level this playing field somehow? Is it scholarshiping? Mm-hmm. Is it moving, um, uh, helping to create resourcing in black neighborhoods that create better educational opportunities? Is it helping support black businesses to create prosperity or businesses owned by black? I think all of those are very concrete ways. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there are others. I am not, um, not very articulate in this arena, I'd have to confess. But those, those come to mind, and I've seen them work. Okay. Uh, we find a lot, a lot of uh, remark, remarkable people in Bible, you know. And uh, do you find any good example for us to find a way not to be the same anymore? Well, certainly Zacchaeus. I think the article mentions Zacchaeus, right? Oh, after, yeah. after he meets Jesus, he, he says he's going to give back the money he's stolen in, in multiple amounts. So... Clearly, there was a reversal of his uh, whole set of values and how he was going to live his life. So, yeah, there are examples of people at the individual level making a change. But let's also remember, um, interestingly, the early church struggled with the idea of can Jews and Gentiles worship together. Mm. So in Acts chapter 11, you see an example of a church in Antioch that clearly has Jews and Gentiles worshiping together. And it was in that place that they were first identified by being followers of Jesus. So yes, I do think there are ways that congregations can also create better multicultural, multiracial settings and worship experiences. Uh, The largest multiracial evangelical church is here in Denver, Colorado. Mm-hmm. pastored by one of our graduates and it is a remarkable uh, testimony to how a church can change lives as they come together white and black and many other uh, racial um, groups as well what advice would you give to a younger generation um, what do they need to carry in their hearts in their next years you know yeah learn your history. I, know, I know you have grandchildren i do yeah, learn the history, learn it, learn the truth, learn the true story. The, the be, be certain that as you teach your children, 
and they teach theirs the the, sto- the true story of how we got to where we are is being told. Uh, that's been a huge problem in uh, our country. I do. Th- I think as well. Um, we have most of us have chosen to live segregated lives, and so if were I to go back and rebuild uh, the way we structured our lives with our kids, uh, I would move into a neighborhood where there were multiple races. Um, we didn't intentionally choose a whites only neighborhood and there certainly were no restrictions on who could live there. But I think our natural tendency is to be around people who are like us. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a special effort to say, I'm going to go live among people and build deep relationships with people at the family level, raise kids together Mm -hmm. across racial lines. I think that's a a marvelous thing. way to move forward and worship together as well mm-hmm. intentionally seek those multiracial multicultural worship experiences and churches mark thank you so much uh, there's so so much wisdom and, and in, a lot of insights and and hope uh for the future um i know that you wrote uh, a prayer in 2016 by the way uh at the end would you be willing just to read uh these powerful words for yeah. all of us Please. I will. Have mercy on me, O Lord. I have blinded my eyes. In spite of the clear evidence of deeply embedded racism all around me, I have looked the other way. Too many have died. Too many have suffered. Too many have locked, been locked out and cast aside. Too many indignities. Too many injustices. And still, I looked the other way. Have mercy on me, O Lord, I have hardened my heart. Believing the lie that blacks have the same opportunities as whites, I could not allow myself to admit that my life was shaped as much by racism as theirs, mine to benefit and theirs to harm. But it was, and it is, and it will continue to be. I have cared too little, I have grieved too little. Have mercy on me, O Lord, I have silenced my tongue. My voice has not been raised in prophetic rebuke and anger. My feet have not stepped out for justice alongside those who have more courage than I. And in my silence, I am an accomplice accomplice to bigotry. Forgive me, O Lord, I have sinned against you and against those who suffer the evil of racism. Indifference has suffered my soul and snuffed out fleeting impulses for reconciliation. I ask for your forgiveness, and I will appropriately seek their forgiveness. Empower me, O Lord. I need your strength to step beyond blindness, indifference, and fear, to step toward those whom I have sinned against. I make no grandiose promises or plans today, for I know how easily these can be made and forgotten. But this I know, I cannot be the same, and I will not. Amen. Amen. Mark, thank you so much again for uh, the talk today. I, I have a lot of hopes, and we pray also in Poland that these changes will happen. Um, I hope you still remember Polish Lody. So anytime you come, you are <laughs> welcome. We are sending uh, warm greetings to your students and your faculty, and I I hope that uh, the school will uh, thrive next uh, years. God bless you. Same same for Ewest and you and Wojtek and the others. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.